You're listening to the Headless WP Podcast, where we discuss all things Headless WordPress. The Headless WP Podcast is a production of the WP Engine Developer Relations Team. If you're interested in more content on Headless WordPress, check out developers.wpengine.com for blog posts, tutorials, videos, and more. All right, welcome to the Headless WP Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Everhart, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Fran Agalto, and we have with us also Matt Landers, formerly of WP Engine DevRel team. Matt is now the head of developer relations for Google Analytics, and so that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. We're super psyched to have Matt here with us. So Matt and Fran, how's it, how's it hanging? Doing good. Good to be back. Awesome. <laughs> this for me is even more stoked because uh, if you listen to the origin stories of when Jeff and I introduced each other on this podcast, you listeners out there, uh, the mystery is unrevealed. This is my mentor. <laughs> this is the man behind the magic of Fran. Uh, he taught me everything <laughs> I know in the covalence food camp. So uh, it's good to have you back, Matt. And I do miss working with you. So yeah, let's. Uh, this is yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, this is going to be I'm fun. excited that this is still going on. <laughs> For sure. I kicked we're, it we're, off and it, it's still yeah, a thing. So Very happy to get it back going. So maybe that's where we could start. So how, how does it feel to be back on the podcast that you uh, and Will Johnson started back uh, several years ago or last Feels year? Feels good. I haven't done a podcast since then. So uh, I missed it. I, I like doing this type of content. So it's fun. It'll be interesting being on the other side, though. Not being yeah. the uh, interviewer, <laughs> being the interviewee. Yeah. So, do do I was wondering about like just a side question, Matt? This in your position, um, which we'll get into at, at uh, Google currently. D- is there going to be a podcast brewing on your end uh, for that for your content? Um, it doesn't lend itself to that. I mean, there there could be. There's not right now. There's no plan right now. I have. Uh, I'm currently working on a video series. Uh, that'll launch sometime this year. It's hard. I'm still working on Google timelines, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. At WP Engine, I could just do something, boom, gone. <laughs> 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 A little harder at Google. So, uh, but yeah, it'll be done this year. Uh, but yeah, no, nothing for podcast right now, but definitely not opposed to it. Nice. Yeah. Definitely that, not opposed to it. That, that would be cool because, like, I think, you know, there's, there's one one of the things I was wondering since, you know, obviously you and I are um, friends outside work, but just for the listeners that, you know, followed you and Will during the uh, height of this podcast, when you started it, when you left like WP Engine and you, could you kind of tell me, tell us for, for um, the podcast, yeah. like, after you left WP Engine, kind of, what what did you do after yeah. that in, in um Yeah. Riding right into the the G train, the Google train. Yeah, I got. Uh, I, w- I wasn't planning on leaving WP Engine. I really liked what I was doing, and I loved the uh, Atlas platform. I uh, you know, obviously, I. I mean, I guess if you've listened to this podcast, you know that I wrote like the very first version of Atlas, which was that was probably one of the more fun times I've had in my career over the last since I, yeah. since leaving my own company. Um, you know, built that platform helped spin up the team started the devrel team so that was a lot of fun uh but after doing that i got recruited by another company star tree um who created uh the founders created the pinot database which is like a high throughput analytical database um and that was just an opportunity to go do something different almost like get back to my roots so when i started at microsoft i was like the sql server expert so to go back okay. to doing database uh, stuff was like something i was excited about and i really liked star tree I, I was doing the same thing i started their devrel team um was growing that and i also was helping with marketing there too uh since i have a lot of marketing experience from my previous companies um and then uh, a friend that I 
used to work with at Microsoft reached out and said, Hey, there's this position. You should interview for it at Google. Uh, and I was like, well, whatever. I've always wanted to interview at Google. So let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that position got filled internally. And uh, after I interviewed and passed all the million tests, you got to pass to get into Google. Uh, the Google Analytics team needed somebody to take over. So I was like, that is right up my wheelhouse. Like that is, I've used Google Analytics when I ran my digital marketing company. I have a lot of experience there from a user standpoint. Uh, so to go there and do DevRel, just, just like, I mean, honestly, it was surprising to have something that relatable uh, at Google to be able to go do. So it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down. So That's awesome. That's where I am now. Well, yeah. And I think for many people, like reaching a place like Google is obviously like that sort of top tier pinnacle of tech companies. So what is it like working at Google and how do they approach uh, developer relations? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, DevRel teams at Google. Um, yeah, I thought going in there would be a DevRel org, but that's not really how it is. Like each product has their own DevRel teams if they need it. Okay. Oh. Um, and then each product approaches DevRel differently. So if you think of if you think of the Atlas platform when I did DevRel there, that's a developer platform. Like developers mm -hmm. are making the decision to buy the product, right? But on Google Analytics, that's not the case. The marketers are choosing Google Analytics and then mm -hmm. the developers have to implement it. So it's a different, it's kind of turned around. So I'm not really doing more of that like uh, adoption and awareness. Also, like most people know what Google Analytics is. So yeah, yeah. You're not you really have doing the recognition a lot of problem that. there. Yeah. So, so it's different than in that respect of I'm not going out and teaching people, hey, there's this thing, it's called Google Analytics. <laughs> it's like... You probably already know that. <laughs> so you, you kind of approach it from a different lens. Um, I'm not trying to go out and tell people about Google Analytics and that it is this. We have a marketing team that does that. Um, I'm more there to support the developers that are implementing Google Analytics, but also other things that I had never done with it. Like there's a whole API surface to Google Analytics that I had never used before. Mm -hmm. So you could build your own. Google Analytics dashboard with our data yeah. APIs or oh. um, build a whole admin panel with our admin API. Like we're trying to get as close to parity with what you can do with the, in the UI with the APIs so that people can build integrations and stuff on top of analytics. That's wow. very cool. I'm a huge fan and have been a long time user of Google Apps Script and oh, yeah. always, yeah, would like, love plugging into some of the like connectors and APIs that are available in that environment. And it would be really easy, like, oh, you want this, this, and this pulled out, you know, into a Google Sheet. Here you go. Bam. Yep. That was always fantastic. Yeah, my my team uh, maintains the Google Analytics uh, Sheets add-on. For okay. okay. So we're actually rewriting that for GA four soon. So stay tuned. Um, cool. But yeah, but that's all app script. It's actually the most used Sheets add-on outside of some of the like official Google Learning add-ons. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. So if like for, for newbie web developers, Matt kind of getting into the space, right. And that haven't, that have a high level idea of, Oh, I know what Google's analytics is. It tracks website, you know, um, users and trafficking and stuff like that. But when you log into the UI, which I did like two weeks ago, just, <laughs> just to get it, it, and this is just for me, since like, like you know what I mean? I'm a little bit on the, um, you guys have, have uh, you and Jeff have way more experience in um, web development and coding than I do. Getting into it new, it, it kind of was a little bit intimidating because there's a lot of things you can do within Google Analytics and in the dashboard. So yeah, could you, could you kind of describe like a, as a web devel developer, especially like doing maybe headless WordPress, what are like the main features that one should actually like, look for um, when you're starting out in as a, as a software engineer, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. I mean, I can give like the high level, like whenever you just install analytics and you get the tagging up, tagging just means like data collection. Uh, that term can be confusing for people at first, but uh, basically put the script tag on your site so that, you know, Google Analytics is loading every page. Immediately, you're going to get automatically collected events like page views, scroll events, um, that kind of stuff. So 
out of the box, just getting it set up, there's a, you can at least see what people are doing on your site. Like what pages are they visiting? Um, how long are they, are they on each page? Like that kind of stuff. Are they scrolling down the page? It's like, if you write a blog and you have analytics there, you can know if people are actually scrolling down the page and reading it. Oh. Uh, if you, if you don't see a scroll event on that page or that's low, then you can probably assume that people aren't reading the whole thing. They're just getting to that page and leaving. Um, but you can also see the path exploration. So how are people using your site? So like if they come into your homepage, where do they go next? Are they going to a blog? Are they going to documentation or what? Like what's the most used path? What are people looking for? And what you can use, do just right out of the box, once you get it set up, is start to use that data to make decisions about what you could change on your website to make it more efficient. So um, you could say, oh, people are having to go from this page to this page to this, to this page to get to the one they actually want. Maybe we can like, reduce the number of clicks needed to get to that content. Uh, if we find that that content is the high value content people are looking for. Uh, maybe you could say most people are coming here to get to the documentation for Atlas. So maybe we'll highlight that in the header instead of like the latest blog post. It just allows you to use that data to make those informed decisions to improve the experience users are having on your site. That's out of the box, right? Uh, and then depending on what you're trying to accomplish on your site, like maybe um, you want people to sign up for the newsletter. Maybe you want yeah. people to buy a product. There's different events that you could collect to try to give you more data in addition to the automatically collected events that can help you improve that funnel or that flow uh, of your site. Wow. So that's, that's interesting. the thing is that like you learn something new every day on the headless WordPress <laughs> podcast, folks. Yeah. My, my, Brain didn't even know that it gets that granular. Like that's oh, the yeah. power of Google Analytics, mm -hmm. right, y'all? Is the granularity within your data sets so that you can make, like Matt said, decisions on how to optimize the user experience on your website. That's, yeah, that's keep in mind it's, it's a, a yeah, it's a platform wild. that you're extending for your use case. Like there's a lot of uh, events that are available to you to capture through. Uh, that we provide to you of like, here's the recommended events you should capture if you're doing e-commerce. Here's the recommended events for different things that you might doing, might be doing. But we don't know every business case of what you're trying to do on your site. So you can also create custom events uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And then you can use that data and create custom reports within analytics to view that and see how you're trending on uh, the things that you care about. And that's really cool. And I think the custom events gives you like another layer of information um, to make those decisions. And so maybe I know me personally, I had a lot of experience with Google Analytics 3. And I know that you all sort of recently updated to version four. And that did sort of like it was kind of like a breaking change, right? You had to get a new new script tag. And, you know, from my the last time I looked at it, those dashboards were very different. So could you kind of give us like an overview of maybe what's changed between those two versions for somebody who's, you know, still in that upgrade process or might not really know yeah. the best way to approach Google Analytics 4. Sure. Um, so just to set the stage for this, uh, Google Analytics 4 is not like a new version of Google Analytics. Okay. It's a completely okay, new product on a whole different oh, architecture oh. and platform. All right. <laughs> So that's why you're seeing kind of that friction of moving from UA, universal analytics. Mm -hmm. We don't really call it GA3. We call it universal okay. analytics and uh, GA4. Uh, UA, okay. UA is technically GA3, but just uh, people will gotcha. probably know it as universal analytics. Oh. Uh, so what happened was that, uh, you know, universal analytics was created 20 years ago. And since then, there are these things we call apps that people use a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're not just measuring our website. We're also measuring what happens in our apps. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, you might have one property that's your website and one that's your app. And those things, that data didn't coexist with each other, right? So with GA4, one of the main concepts is that you have your property that you have data streams coming from different places. So you might have a data stream coming for your website. And you also might have one coming from your, your iOS app, your Android app, okay, um, or any uh, other places as well, like offline events, et cetera. Awesome. So that way you can have all of the data of what's happening in your ecosystem all in one place, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
Another thing that changed is the event model. So uh, when we talk about creating events and custom events, that's, uh, that's really the uh, one of the large changes there because in UA, everything was kind of based around sessions. And when you go in an app, you don't have mm-hmm. the same mechanism for sessions. So we kind of okay. created this model of just events. Um, and then that also allowed itself to be more geared towards privacy. So obviously, you know, the, the privacy landscape is changing all the time and we want to make sure that we're protecting users data. That's the most important thing uh, to us in analytics right now is making sure that we support the ability to anonymize things, to uh, leave out as much data about the user as possible, but still give you the measurement capabilities that you need in order to uh, pr- make it it still needs to be valuable, right? Like we need to know what's happening on the site, but we don't need Mm -hmm. to know necessarily the exact person who's on the site all the time. Uh, So GA4 is really built around that privacy concept. Well, that's cool. So it seems like that sort of shift to a multi-platform approach really kind of supports also what Headless WordPress is looking to do, right? If we have all these different properties, should be able to analyze them all in a coherent way. And I sort of like, like, I haven't dug into GA4 yet a lot, but I know from my experience working as a developer with UA, like a lot of those metrics weren't always super helpful, like time on page. Great. We know that. And that's a good metric. And oftentimes when I work with people, they would get hung up on like trying to game those metrics where it's like, well, we want to raise our mm-hmm. time on page. And I'd have to explain, well, it really uh-huh. depends on what the content <laughs> is. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So is this a long form blog post? then yeah, we want a high time on page. Is this your FAQ page where you want somebody to be able to find something really easily? And like, it should be 30 seconds and they got their answer and they're gone. And so having those conversations with stakeholders was always sort of a challenge when it was centered around these these sort of ambiguous numbers or like aggregated numbers. And like, that's one I can remember trying to explain to people why some page we might want high bounce rates on some pages where that was like, if you come into that page, only be that page and then hit the road, you know, but it was for that same reason. Like, do we, did they come and find the answer they were looking for and go on their way? Cause if so, like that's a marker of success and not one of failure. And so it just sometimes a convoluted process and you really had to like dig into what are my goals for this piece of content. And so I think, I think centering that around events and really being able to say, uh, this is how they interact with people. Um, you know, it's a yeah. good thing. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. Like a lot of times you go out, you read a blog post by somebody and they say, here's the things you should care about, but you, know, you need high time on page, you need low bounce rate, you need mm-hmm. <laughs> all of these things. And that's not necessarily the case. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your content or with your mm-hmm. users. Uh, so it's important that you think those things through as you're collecting the data and try to make the best informed decisions as you can and give people what they need. Like you made it a good point. Like if you go to an FAQ, you don't want them, they're not reading the whole yeah. FAQ. Like yeah. they're looking you want for them something. to find the thing and then get out of here. <laughs> they want to find out. it and get out. get out. But you may also be writing a piece of content like a blog post where you don't necessarily want them to read it and leave, right? Mm-hmm. You might want them to read it and then read the next post. Or mm-hmm. you might want them to then also check out your products. Uh, so you do care about bounce rate there. Like you want time on page to be good because you want them to engage with the content. But mm-hmm. You also want to make sure that they're that the page is built in a way that leads them to the next step. Um, oh yeah. So it just depends on what you're what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, Jeff, are we? And it's funny. This might be a good segue into the into the next question I had for you, Matt. Um, as far as like utilization for Google anal- Analytics on a headless WordPress website that might do hybrid routing. But before you answer that, Matt, like Jeff, we, Kellen's implemented, he uses Google Analytics on our DevRel site, right? Uh, I think if it's not there, I think it's in the process of getting Oh, it's it. in the process. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know the status. All right. Oh, I would have swore we thought we set that up, but I'm hmm. pretty sure we did. But maybe it got taken off. I don't know. <laughs> we built the original site. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your your stuff. Well, let's still assume longer. it's there. Yeah, let's yeah. assume it's there. I would assume let's, it's there. Yeah, let's assume it's there. And your your yeah your you and Will's post are still on there. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that next question I had for you, Matt, is yeah, how how can you utilize Google Analytics on a headless WordPress website? 
that might do uh, hybrid routing? Yeah, it's going to wildly depend on how you build the site. Um, okay. If you're doing all client side routing, then you're going to need to make a call into gtag.js, which is the, so you'll call the function and make sure you're logging those page views and the different events that are happening. Um, but there, there's documentation on the tagging platform on Google, on the developer docs for developers.google.com slash tagging, I think. Uh, that can talk about single page apps. So if you have a single page app, how you would actually do that tagging versus if you had a if you had a static site where you're loading the page every time, then you can do it the traditional the traditional way. It's just going to depend on how you built your site um, and whether or not you're going to need to intervene and uh, call some of those uh, events yourself. Okay. So you, for instance, if you wrote a completely client side React app. There's actually a, a, a package called React-GA, appropriately named, uh, okay. that you can use, and then that will help you out. Um, but, but essentially, you want to make sure that whenever you're routing and you're changing the content on the page, even though it's not a new page view, it is a new page view, right? And like you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you're, you're logging that so that you get the appropriate data into GA so that your reports light up. Oh, yeah. There it is. There's an NPM package, react -GA. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And you said that was through Tag Manager? And maybe maybe you could, because I've heard Tag Manager used, and maybe I'm not using the right terminology. Well, how are those two things associated, Google Analytics and Tag Manager? Yeah. Tagging is how you collect the data. So there's two different ways you can do it. You can use Google Tag Manager, which is a UI codeless based tagging platform. So you can use this not only for Google Analytics, but for Google Ads, for Facebook, LinkedIn. You can use this UI to manage all of your different tags. Um, so I definitely recommend using Tag Manager just because it's nice not to have, to, you can make changes to your implementations without necessarily deploying a new website, uh, which is nice. Um, but then there's also um, Google Site Tag or the Google Tag, this is all being, this is all kind of like influx right now, but let's just call it the Google tag. Um, and that there's also programmatic access to that as well. So you can, okay. there's a function that you can call G tag, pass in data that then makes its way to the platform. Um, and we're, we're, this is all being kind of uh, worked on now. I, I actually don't know everything that I can say about what's coming with that, but so I don't want to. I don't want to say too much. I, I, we, I, we get I, it. We won't. We won't like cry. And what I know is coming is blurry yeah. to me. So I don't want to yeah. go too far on that. But essentially, there's a UI-based way that you can do tagging and a code-based way. I think that depending on how you write your headless site, you may have to use the code-based way. Like I said, if you're doing all client-side routing, you may have to do that yourself. Okay. Versus if your routing is happening, if you're if you're loading new pages. And you know you're getting that browser event happening, yeah. uh, then you may not have to do any of the use the code on your site. Okay. And then if you're doing some combination of the two, then obviously, yeah. Like, then you, yeah, so you got to make regular sure that, script yeah. tag and then yeah. tap into your framework's routing right. mechanism and yeah, whatever that is. Page use so, okay. Um, whatever. I mean, with today's cool. with everything being SSR and static generation, it gets a little simpler. Um, but if you are doing the client-side routing on stuff, you might wanna, you just gotta keep that in mind. So it, it can be more complicated than it, than it really needs to be. Now on a traditional web per, WordPress site, it's super simple <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> every page is just loaded from the server, server and you're getting a whole new page every time. So it's not yeah. a lot to do. Um, and, and I will also say I was a big fan of the site kit plugin mm -hmm. for traditional WordPress that I think helps simplify the connection between your site and Google Analytics. And it's it's great. Um, right. And that's and so actually, for people who don't know, that's a Google provided yeah. like WordPress oh. plugins. What, what's and the name of the plugin, y'all, again? Can you can site, site kit? kit? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really nice um, and, and well done. And for setting stuff up on traditional WordPress sites, it was super easy. But I did like do just kind of in preparation for this, I did a bunch of Googling and it was like, there weren't really any tutorials out there on setting Google Analytics up with a headless WP site. So I think we've got 
Ooh. some content that we'll need to go back Hell and do. Yeah. But lots of uh, requests on that SiteKit plugin for it. So a number of people asking and just right. didn't seem like, you know, understandably that that was on the roadmap to support since I think it's probably like, you know, up to yeah. the developer how that how that plays out. It's yeah. fun. Did a bunch of demos when you were here, man. I don't think you did. You never did that. I don't Except know. That. Yeah. I remember one time when, on a Friday, you you straight out did Dino. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome, man. Yeah. I, I mean, love Dino. I'm oh, using yeah, Dino yeah. in some of my videos. Yeah. So. Oh, nice. Have you I seen Bun? Yeah. yeah. Bun. Bun. Yeah. That looks kind of nice. Yeah. yeah. I feel like now we're getting like a little too many yeah. of these, but I like Dino. Um, I do want to have a PSA about GA4 that okay. we didn't really get into. And we yeah, talked about yeah, the difference please. between UA and GA4. Um, so my publisher's announcement is that G UA, so Universal Analytics, is going to be deprecated in July 2023. Um, okay. Okay. And one, one of the consequences of that is that the data that you have in UA won't end up in your GA4 property. So you need to do this now. You need to start at least the very... At the very least, you need to start, you need to tag your site for GA4 and be collecting in UA and J4 mm -hmm. so that you have a year's worth of data or roughly a year, less than a year now. So if you're listening to this and it's 2022, mm -hmm. go dual tag your site. Just look it up. Dual tagging is something you really need to be doing if you already have yeah. UA um, or you're going to have that transition period and you're going to have a loss of data. So you won't be able and, to see that year over year data if you don't do this right now. Yeah. And I will support Matt's PSA having <laughs> went through that at the job I was at before WP Engine, where yes, the data is very different. It is not the same. There's no taking it over. But yeah, dual tagging is, is a possibility of having both run until you figure out. Right. Because that's what we had to do. We had to say, all right, we've got all these things and processes and metrics built around this stuff. How do we translate that to this? And having both available. Yeah. And you just have to have the while you're making those decisions. Yeah. So we're recommending like at least 90 days worth of data before you okay. turn the other off if you do. Okay. Well, cool. Yeah. We will definitely PSA you on that. Yeah. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, uh, but WordPress and obviously headless WordPress are used pretty globally. You know, we work with developers all over the world who are trying to spin up um, headless WordPress sites. And so obviously, you know, there's different privacy laws all over the place. So if you, you wouldn't mind just kind of doing a deep dive into your Google Analytics uh, stance towards privacy and things like GDPR and what considerations a dev might need when implementing in, say, Europe. Yeah, I would say that, you know, every feature that we think about implementing, we have to think about the privacy implications of that and how um that affects the product i mean there have been things where i'm like why don't we do this and they're like well yeah but <laughs> we don't want to collect that piece of data yeah okay that's a good point uh so there's a lot of things going on uh to improve the privacy i mean ga4 was built with privacy at the core pillar from the ground up um so there's a lot of options for you on what you choose to collect and what you choose not to collect uh, for instance, like you can anonymize the IP, so you're not even collecting IP anymore. Okay. We also have server-side tagging so that you can have a container on your server where all the tagging information comes to, so all the data that you're collecting, and choose what actually gets sent to analytics or not. So for instance, in Europe, you there are uh, countries where you can't send the data directly to the US. So what you can mm -hmm. do is you have a server-side tag, it goes onto your Europe-based um processing and then you know you filter out what can't be sent to google analytics and then we process what we can whatever sent uh there's also things like consent mode built into ga4 so and what that means is you know you get that pop-up like do you allow us to track you or use cookies like that's built into uh, ga4 and the tagging platform as well oh, nice. uh, and then we're doing things to fill in the gaps which i think is really critical here so Every analytics platform is going to have to do some version of consent mode, right? Uh, you're going to have to ask users, like, is it okay if we track you or not? Uh, and then there's going to be some percentage of users that choose not to be tracked. And what happens today on most platforms is that you just have a gap in what's happening on your site, right? You just don't know. Those users aren't being tracked. That data is not being collected. It's not showing up in your reports. Uh, so what we've released recently is called behavioral modeling. 
Uh, it's where we use AI and machine learning to actually fill in those gaps. Uh, so we can, we can know like based on the percentage of people who are consenting and you know, all the data that we have about people who consent and don't consent, we can fill in the gaps of like page views, time on page, like uh, purchase events, everything. We fill those in with uh, data that comes from our machine learning models uh, so that you get a clearer picture of what's actually happening on your site and you don't have those oh, gaps geez. that you have today. So that part is really cool that you get out of it. That's probably one of the biggest benefits of moving from UA to GA4 is like now you'll actually know what's happening. <laughs> right now you don't know because if they're blocking their cookies or they have an ad blocker, like you, you're just losing that data. Um, but we can provide uh, the data through our machine learning models to fill in those gaps. Awesome. All sounds great. And yeah, the data is that's called data sovereignty, right? When like you can't have data leave that source country. And I know um, a lot of work with some Canadian places where that that seemed to be the right. The, the and there's a lot of tools well. within GA to, you know, if data is coming from a specific country, I mean, you can set all that up. So, and is that something that people need to think about, or is it does it just is it smart enough on the back end to just do that? No, you need you definitely need to configure things based on where okay. you're where you're located and the laws that you need okay. to follow. So gotcha. Okay, cool. So this is uh one thing that I have been dying to know, Matt, because it's clear that you've been a big proponent of headless WordPress from the beginning. Uh, I even dare to say that you might be one of the pioneers. Um, that's bringing a headless WordPress hosting platform to, to light since, um, and listeners of the old podcast when Matt and Will were on, uh, this Alice was born out of a hackathon project, if I'm not mistaken, Matt, historically. Well, uh, not hackathon, but what was it? Was basically, it? what happened was I, I mean, I had been building sites with front end frameworks for a decade. Yeah, we built like I left Microsoft to create a front end framework. <laughs> so, like, Platypus.io, right? Yeah, Platypus. Platypus TS. We wrote it in yeah, TypeScript right, in 2013. Yeah. Just want to say we were way too early. Uh, but oh, wow, that great is a framework. Uh, but never, never took off like the others. But I have a lot of experience in building sites like that where you're using APIs from the front end versus doing the postbacks all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, it just it was very clear to me very early. Like when I saw the alpha and beta version of Angular, I was like, holy yeah. shit, this is it. Angular JS, <laughs> man. Josh is going to take over the world. That was the <laughs> That's why sauce, I left dude. Microsoft to start a front end framework. I was like, let's go build a framework that's made for enterprises, that's like really thinks about application lifecycle management. Like that was all of our framework was built around those like very enterprise y type concepts. Uh, that people were using ASP.NET for back in the day. Um, so, you know, I really saw this early on and started building our, our framework for that. We built our own headless CMS out of our framework. Um, and it was just when people would go to sites that we created with our framework and on our CMS versus other sites, they're like, holy crap, like this doesn't even seem real. It's so fast. <laughs> like, like, is this fake? Are these screenshots? Um, so it just became very clear to me, like this was going to be the future of how websites are built. Um, and then when I came to WP Engine, I was like, man, you navigate some of these sites on WordPress. You're just like, this is not the best experience that I could have, but there is an API there. Uh, and then GraphQL is, uh, or WP GraphQL is amazing. I was like, mm -hmm. we can actually create a similar experience that we created on our headless, on our purpose-built headless CMS on WordPress. Uh, the piece that was missing at WP Engine or just in the WordPress hosting in general is like, now I got to host my node yep. code somewhere else or my front-end code somewhere mm -hmm. else. And that just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it just made a lot of sense to try to build a platform where you got the WordPress backend and you got the front-end hosting all in one package. And that's where... Uh, that's when I, I put together a presentation, actually, I presented it to, at the time, my boss, Brandon. Uh, he had me take that to Jason Cohen. We, I did like a, a long session with him. I was like, hey, this is where you got to go. If you don't go, you're going to die. 
<laughs> it's a very dire message I sent. It was probably a little <laughs> dramatic, but <laughs> but uh, that's just how that's how I roll. So uh, he eventually, or like a few months later, you know, they're like, "Hey, we're gonna do this headless thing. We want you to lead it." And I like sat in a dark room for three months and built the first version of Atlas, got that running on wow. Kubernetes and Knative, and that was a uh, really. I had a, such a fun time building that thing. And then they really bought in. They're like, this is it. Let's do it. We built the whole engineering team around that. We knew that we needed DevRel at that point to educate people on what is headless. How do you build great headless sites? Then how do you deploy those on, on Atlas? Mm -hmm. um, you, so yeah, that's kind of like how, that's how the platform was it, born. It was, I basically yeah, was like, I wanted it to happen really badly. Yeah. And, well, I just, and it needed to happen. I think if this was going to, going to go any further, because like yeah. I'd been doing, I'll call it like partially headless development for the exact reason you mentioned. Like I didn't want to have to have two hosts. Like it was just too much DevOps burden for the teams that I was on, where like right. we would end up making these WordPress themes that would only like they'd ship one div tag in the theme and then that div would load up a view app or something else and everything would be, else would be done via apis but it wasn't until i saw this where i was like oh wow this really solves this problem and makes this style of development so much more viable for the people who can afford you know like a devops person or somebody to manage all these machines because it, it does kind of get out of hand quickly once yeah, it just doesn't make sense to manage it yourself no. like you should be spending your time building your app not yeah. Yeah. deploying <laughs> <laughs> well so let me ask you this Matt, because then this will help us here not only wp engine but just kind of the future state of uh everybody's beloved cms wordpress <laughs> mm -hmm. from a future standpoint let's just let's then let's have a let's let's be candid here like from a future standpoint right like I'm obviously on the headless WordPress DevRel team. Jeff is too, for a reason, because we believe in that. Is WordPress, whether you like it or not, going anywhere? No, probably not. Whether you like it or not, it's probably going to be around for a while. Uh, I always say it's going to be around when I'm when I'm dead and six feet under for sure. But from a developer standpoint, Matt, and I, I kind of just want like some some hard bullet points from your end because I've heard you. Uh, talk and and preach it about like hey extending wordpress to be like those purpose built headless cmss out there in the world just so that the developers have a better time adopting it for its fle flexibility but you could you give us like your like if i if money was no object and yeah you, like a wave you know magic wand yeah if what would wordpress wave, core have yeah wave that magic wand mat and tell us what you think wordpress needs to sustain and keep up with the Jamstack Joneses, as I call it, if you will, <laughs> um, to, <laughs> to be to be relevant in 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 the in the headless CMS space. And, and this podcast has produced at least ten trademark worthy things, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> so we got to TM that Jamstack Joneses. <laughs> yeah, so what I do you think. think um, I think the biggest. I, well, first, I just want to say, like, a lot of people have put a lot of effort into making WordPress fast, as is, like the traditional WordPress. Like, you can make it fast. Uh, you can do a lot of tricks on the caching side. Um, you know, a lot of people put a lot of engineering time into making PHP faster and making, you know, cache, caching different pages and uh, putting a lot of complexity around how to cache. Uh, and so you can make it very fast. And that, but that to me, that's not the, that's not, the main thing headless brings you like, yes, headless is fast. We know that, but that's not the critical component. I think the, the critical piece about headless is that developers like to do it. And at the end of the day, websites are built by developers. And look, the trend doesn't look good for PHP. I'm not saying PHP is not going away. There's a ton of code written in PHP, but guess what? COBOL is not going away either. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean that a lot of future development is going to be in COBOL. And I would, I would dare to say, I'll go out on a limb here, that PHP is not the future of software development. Like, it's had a great run. But you can go onto Google Trends and uh, see that PHP is not on an uptrend here. Like, yeah. um, so at the end of the day, developer experience is critical to adoption, especially whenever you're building 
whenever you're building something like a website or, you know, especially a, a complex, large website, you know, a cat blog can live on traditional WordPress forever, but, mm -hmm. you know, a high volume content publishing site is going to have so many benefits from being headless and having a good developer experience. I'm um, being able to take advantage of all the code that's been written for Node and, uh, you know, these different platforms, like people are continuing to invest in that. Uh, and you don't see the same type of support from a, like a, a library standpoint or a framework standpoint for other platforms like you do for JavaScript. So to me, you know, it's, yes, you can, you make traditional WordPress as fast as these, you know, these modern frameworks. Sure. You can get close there. You're going to, there's going to be some caveats there. Yeah. Um, but that's not the point. Like you're missing the point at that point. And do you, do you developer feel, experience is everything <laughs> no and i i mean yeah that's not um i definitely don't disagree with you there do you feel like at its current state with with its, its extensibility right now like you mentioned wp graphql now that you can have a graphql endpoint coming out of wordpress and just consume that data do you think it's in a pretty good place right now uh as as just a headless cms as far as like, hey, I, I can I can download this plugin, right? I can consume this data from this GraphQL endpoint, or you could use REST, whatever. Or is it still lacking something, Matt, that has like one or two features that you're like, okay, if if I had one, these one or two features, I'll use that. I'll use WordPress as my CMS if I if I'm using a next front end. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's anything lacking from being able to create a data model that you can extract via the API. Yeah. Uh, I think that where it gets confusing is when you're creating content within WordPress and you're not getting that WYSIWYG experience that you do in traditional WordPress. So when I'm writing a blog and I'm adding images here and doing, all, you know, I'm, I'm formatting my blog in the editor, that's not necessarily what's going to show up on the front end. That can be confusing. I think that solving that problem is critical for WordPress. Um, I think that giving a better experience for the data entry whenever you do create data models, like wow. with ACF or ACM, uh, there's also a lot of just baggage there that comes from traditional WordPress that you don't need. That'd be nice if it was just gone. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done there on the back end, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that know how to use WordPress on the back end. Yeah. And I think it's advantageous to creating an environment where the developer can have the experience that they want, the marketer can have the experience that, that they desire, and having like some, some symbiosis or something there. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So, it just needs to be that experience just needs to be better. And I know that that's what yeah. WP Engine is working on. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see the future there. I wish that. WordPress itself was working on this, but it just seems like they don't care uh, about headless. Yeah. And that part's frustrating. I think that it would be nice if there were a version of WordPress that didn't have to be backwards compatible and you could really hone in on making a really great headless open source CMS. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that WordPress is, you know, open source and GPL gives it a lot of advantages and it's really what's kept it alive for so long, uh, having that ecosystem, uh, it'd be nice to have a, uh, for WordPress to be able to mo morph into more of a modern CMS, yeah. but as long as you have to support that backwards compatibility, it becomes difficult to create the, you know, the best user experience possible for the marketer. I see that. And I know if you're, you know, especially with your position being that developer experience is super important, you know, most of that development work on WordPress core isn't done in GitHub, you know, like, so that I know for a lot of people, it's just a barrier to entry. I've never used SVN because I've never had a need to like upload anything to the plugin repository or whatever. So like, I wouldn't have the first clue about how to get started and, you know, trying, trying to contribute in that way. Um, and the other thing, yeah, but too they don't really like, accept contributors in that way either. Like you're not going to go in and make a major change and shift into features uh, geared towards headless because automatic owns that. 
oh. that roadmap, yeah. right? So. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll also go back, and there was one other interesting thing I think you said that I want to touch on. It has to do with kind of the difference in philosophy, maybe between like some of the stuff that I'm around headless and traditional, like, and this goes back to Fran, our conversation with Lee, where we were talking about like Next.js and their image component, right? He was like, we wanted to build this component that where it was like the developer could just walk in, you plop a URL in there, and then you can trust that the framework is going to do whatever is most optimal for that user to give them the best experience. And, and like, it's that philosophy that I think Headless enables where it's like, I can pick this best tool and let it make all these decisions for me, where I did a deep dive recently into like Remix and Next and looked at a bunch of like link prefetching, right? You hover over a link, it goes, fetches the prefetches that resource for you, stores it in your browser cache, super fast experiences. And then I was like, okay, you know, this is all enabled by default for me in these frameworks. Or WordPress, I've got to go find like the one plugin that exists with 15 installs to like make that a possibility. And I think it's that difference where it's like, that's what headless brings you is you get these sort of out of the box, just fast things with these best practices where WordPress, I've got to make this intentional choice to go and say, oh, I want link prefetching. Oh, I'm going to install this image optimization plugin. And I have to make all these decisions. And no, it just, I don't know. It, in, in some ways that can be more difficult. I mean, you're making the same decisions on the front end. You got to go choose what you're going to use. Uh, I just feel like you can, the sources where you're deciding to do that are more trusted, right? So, yeah. Well, and a lot of them have said this is the floor, right? Like Remix and Next all enable that by default. So, just by opting into one of those, like I'm going to get, I mean, Remix, Next, all those, like, it's yeah. it's there in some capacity, and I don't really have to think. Yeah, about that it. that particular feature, sure, but yeah, you know, th there's always other things that you're bringing in. And I think that's a a, a key component as well. Yeah. Are there a lot of the plugins for WordPress right now are not headless enabled, which is frustrating yeah. as well. Uh, it's pretty, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of them was yeah, and that's confusing for the marketer too because they'll go find a blog that says, "Hey, just install this plugin, and it's going to work." And it's like, well, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. No, and and that's something we hear repeated in the community a lot. It's just a lot like that that problem needs to be solved, like a tighter integration between the block editor data and what you get back from, say, WP yeah. GraphQL. Like that, that could be more structured and more easy to work, or sorry, easier to work with. Um, um, okay, so just a time check here. In respect to your time, Matt, we've got five minutes left. So I always have like a fun question. I know I know you as a personal friend, but our listeners don't. So the friend's fun question to end this podcast is, Matt Landers, when you're coding and you need a break from code, like if you're just like, man, no one should be coding for 40 hours a week. I, I'm getting twisted sideways looking at syntax for like, when something doesn't work or you just need a refresher and step away from the screen, what is your one or two go-to activities uh, that you do to clear your head away from code to get that uh, inspiration back to get on that computer and start hammering at that keyboard to type <laughs> out that syntax? First of all, I'd like to say that I wish I was coding for 40 hours a week. Uh -oh. <laughs> but that's not what I get to do all the time, unfortunately. I love to code, so like uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a dream in and of itself. I oh. um, also have a five and two year old, so it's not quite yeah, as easy to do whatever yeah. I want. But to answer your question, if I need a break and like I just want to do my own thing, uh, and I do this pretty often, uh, I get once a week, we get like a free night out and I go eat sushi with Fran and some friends. So that I like to do, just hang out with friends. Uh, but also I play uh, Team Fight Tactics, which is a riot game it's like legal i played league of legends for a long time but that the time investment that you need to be good at league of legends is just too high with kids and a real job uh, <laughs> but team fight tactics is like right there at that spot where i can be pretty good at it and like i'm a high-end top two percent player but without having to dedicate you know 80 yeah. hours a week to it so it's and never that, fun to be a bottom rung video game player <laughs> Matt, is that like a role-playing game never fun. Is it like a no? It's a it's called auto chess, but basically it's like it really reminds me of like you know how they played chess in Star Wars, where like the characters move. Oh yeah, and cool. Yeah, it's nice. kind of like that. You put your characters on the board and you let them duke it out, 
and uh, whoever wins. Oh, yeah. oh, There's strategy that. around it, but you'd have to impossible. That's a whole podcast in itself. If you want to talk about TFT, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now I really like to do that. What else do I do? Oh, well, you, obviously I like Legos. Dude, is that um, Star Wars Legos? Right? No, Star yeah, Wars Legos. I also have yeah. like all the NASA Legos. Oh, that's uh, sick. Oh, oh, I, made nice. a, I made a Lego of myself. So. Oh, what? dude. Whoa. I got a lightsaber and a keyboard. I was going to say, is that a, lights- a lightsaber and a keyboard? <laughs> oh, that's man. fantastic. There's a cool program called stud.io uh, where you can you 3D model everything. They'll tell you all the bricks you need to actually build it. Oh, and actually wow. auto-generate a where do you like, instruction brick? booklet for you too, which is cool. What do you order the bricks from though? Once you, uh, you can you can order some off Lego, but you can there's a um, brick link man where you can actually Lego. If you're buy listening, it. buy that company. <laughs> like it seems like that's just made for Lego. Like made for, so you yeah. scan yourself in, we'll ship you the bricks. Yeah, Lego already bought brick, brick link, so they oh, did okay. buy it. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, see, my business <laughs> out sense is is on. Like, point. This is a good idea. Vertical uh-huh. integration. Yeah. What else do I do? Um, I hang out, go dad, swim, hang out with the kids. Yeah. Being a dad cool. is a full-time job. So in, in, in retrospect, just thinking about it, do you actually get to code at least 10 hours a week nowadays, Matt? Or not, not really. Like if I'm going to do it, it's going to have to be something I'm really choosing to do. Like I don't have anything in, in my job that I need to go code per se. I mean, I'm, I'm doing these videos and I got to write some code for that, but I mean, that's super light. I'm not building anything for production. One thing I have been working on is a, a discord bot for GA so that you can add this bot to uh, your discord server and then it'll feed data into Google analytics, oh, which is pretty cool. cool. Uh, so, and I've been writing that in rust. So I've been a real big, fan of rust and learning that so that's been fun uh on the side but yeah i don't i don't really get to code a lot it's sad oh man i'm trying to find ways to code to code yeah because i love well, to code like, like i've good, been coding yeah. i really can't remember a time in my life where i didn't code anymore <laughs> <laughs> i've been coding for like 25 years we were we were we were on a call with one of our um and en- uh sales engineers here uh, you probably remember him jordan yeah yeah you probably remember him and he, he was he was telling us like when when you're on that side yeah he gets to code high level like demos yeah. and stuff like that but it's like oh my god I don't want to lose my technical chops because <laughs> my day to day is not coding anymore you know what I'm saying and it's like like you said you have to find find ways to to hack essentially but anyway yeah. as you grow in your developer career you end up in more meetings and yeah, doing more exactly architecture that. stuff and less coding and it gets kind of sad because i would rather just sit i mean i'm an introvert i would rather just sit yeah. and like code some stuff oh. rather than sit in meetings all day but at the same time when you're in those meetings you have influence over what's happening and that's fun too so i mean it's just you can't do it all you gotta you choose do it all. you gotta choose yeah. <laughs> all right matt well awesome i i appreciate you coming on man you you're um you've done a lot for my career you're a great mentor and a great friend and we always appreciate your uh, insights and thanks for starting this podcast yeah, for <laughs> sure for sure thank you so much yeah, thanks for having for me on the groundwork yeah we're happy it's to my have first you. podcast maybe. since uh joining google so oh cool maybe maybe we'll rope you into doing a live stream where we like it hey that'd be cool or something okay cool that'd be That's rougher something. than it used to be i haven't coded in a while but that, <laughs> oh, no. maybe that would make it that would make yeah. it interesting <laughs> yeah matt is there is there anything you want to uh drop to the audience as, as far as like are you releasing any kind of um videos for uh content anything like that to watch out for on yeah we're going to be releasing some uh i'm working on a series uh for google analytics those will show up but they'll they'll show up all everywhere um for google they'll be on youtube they'll be in the documentation they'll be everywhere so if you are doing anything google analytics you'll probably see see me at some point <laughs> Okay. We'll make sure uh, to amplify those two for you when they come. Yeah, out. I'll I'll send them out once the once they're ready. Sweet. I'm excited Sweet. about it though. So. Yeah, that'll be cool. cool All right, man. Thanks for coming again. Have a good afternoon. All right. Later, Matt. All right, you too. Thanks for having me on. Bye, y'all. Cheers. All right, see ya. Thanks for tuning in to the Headless WP Podcast. If you liked today's episode, go ahead and give us a share or a like on whatever platform you're listening on. 
And be sure to keep in touch with the WP Engine Developer Relations team on Twitter, Discord, or through our website. Thanks for listening.